Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I am here without Seth, who is on vacation. We try not to let him leave the office as much as we possibly can, and yet he has managed to get away. Today on the show, divorce, it, it's never easy, but for military families, the process can be even more complex and emotionally charged. From navigating the division of military pensions and thrift savings plans to creating parenting plans that account for the unique demands of military life, there are countless factors to consider when a military marriage comes to an end. This week, we dive into the world of military divorce with our own Kristen Scully, family law attorney with NLG Family Law. Kristen, welcome to The Toaster. Thank you for having me, Pete. Kristen, it, it is about time. You're still fairly new at the firm, and we're really, really glad to have you and to introduce you to uh, our audience. I think everybody's had a rotation in the hot seat when Seth goes on vacation, and it is, in fact, your turn. Start us off a little bit with your background. What led you down this path to to have at least a specialty in military divorce? So I've been practicing family law for um, a little over 10 years now. And I started working with a firm in 2017 that primarily focused on military issues, um, military divorce, pension division, things like that. And um, I was there for over six years and I learned a lot. It was really interesting to me. Um, All of the jurisdictional issues, the issues with the pension, the issues with parenting plans when you're dealing with people that move frequently. And I really grew, grew to love it. And so that's kind of been my little niche over the past six years or so, and and I hope to continue um, helping military families moving forward. When you when you think about military divorce, when we think about military divorce, what what are the kind? I mean, I know we have sort of a grab bag of topics here, but but writ large, what are the kinds of challenges that military families tend to face when going through a divorce? You know, one of the biggest issues when there's children involved with a military divorce is these families move so frequently. Um, generally, you have a PCS or permanent change of station every you know, three to four years. And so when the service member is having to move often, how do we construct a parenting plan that's going to work for that family where the former spouse, generally the mom um, is, not, is the one that's you know, staying in one spot with the kids and then the service member still needs to PCS every three or four years. And then you're also dealing with deployments. Um, how do we handle time sharing when a parent is deployed? That I think is, you know, the number one issue that people are concerned about when you're dealing with a military divorce is what happens with the kids. Well, okay, so we're going to be talking about the kids for sure. I know that's part of our grab bag. Let's start with a little bit of money. Let's start with the military pension division. How does how does the division of the military pension divorce uh, in work in a divorce? Sure. So the military pension, when you have a military family, the pension is generally going to be their biggest asset. So that is going to be the most important asset that we're dealing with as far as equitable distribution. And in Florida, you start with the presumption that all marital assets and marital liabilities are split 50-50. So that would include the pension that's earned during the marriage. So we look at the date that the parties were married, We look at the date that the military member entered service, and then we look at the date that the petition for dissolution of marriage is filed or whatever date that we're using to value the pension, which is typically the date of filing. And we try to come up with what percentage of that pension is marital. From there, once we have that marital portion, um, we're able to divide the pension. Um, There's very specific language that we have to include in any sort of marital settlement agreement or final judgment when we're dividing the pension. But that pension, you know, a lot of service members think, you know, oh, it's mine. I earned it. I'm the one that, you know, was going through deployments and things like that. But the Uniform Service Former Spouses Protection Act, which is the USF SPA, really recognizes the fact that these former spouses, you know, they're a big part of our military too. And we need to protect what they're entitled to as well. That's fascinating. I I imagine that comes as a as a, a a surprise. What other misconceptions? I mean, I do do families have when when thinking about the the complexities of determining the pension, how the pension is settled. So one of the big misconceptions that um, I see with regard to the military divorce or military pension is that the pension can't be divided if you weren't married for at least ten years. 
And that's not the case. The military pension is a marital asset. It doesn't matter if you're married for one year, 10 years, 20 years. Um, it's a, it's an asset that needs to be divided in divorce. The 10 year piece of it is that DFAS, which is the organization through the military that pays the military members and, you know, writes the checks for the pension. They will not pay a former spouse directly for their share of the pension unless there's 10 years of marriage that overlap with 10 years of service. So that's where that 10 year piece comes in. But if you are married for less than 10 years, you're still entitled to the military pension. Okay, so that was a that's that brings up another question that uh, it feels more complicated than <laughs> than maybe it, I expected it to be. DFAS, who do they pay if it's under 10 years? Do they pay the service member, member and the service member is responsible for sending a check? Yeah, so the so DFAS will pay the military member their entire portion of the pension. And then if it was a less than 10 year marriage, then the service member is responsible for paying the former spouse their share of the pension directly. So that comes with a whole host of problems because the military member is being taxed on the full amount. And, you know, how do we um, figure out what they should be paying versus what they might actually be paying? So it can get complicated. Well, it, it, you just made it sound all complicated. And the only thing I'm thinking about is what if they're deployed? How do they write checks every month when they're deployed? Well, so the military pension you are collecting once you're retired, right? Oh, so right, right, right. Of course. Collecting, yeah. So you're not going to be dealing unless you have somebody that is a civilian employee, you know, after they retire um, that may, you know, travel, you know, as part of their um, civilian job. But um, you're not going to be dealing with typical deployments and things like that. So most of the time when you're dealing with direct payments, um, the people will set up an allotment to ensure that the former spouse gets their share. But it can be diff- difficult to calculate what they're entitled to if it's a less than 10 year marriage because you have COLAs each year, which is the cost of living adjustment that goes into effect yearly. And the former spouse is entitled to that COLA. And then obviously the taxes that are being paid by the service member. So when we're drafting these agreements, when you're dealing with a less than 10 year marriage, we need to try to account for all of those things. Uh, okay. So that uh, where I had gone in my head already was th- thinking about things like uh, alimony and, and child support. Maybe we should do that because my cart got in front of my horse. Is m- managing the, the complexities of, of dealing with financing the divorce uh, it, during a, uh, you know, during a deployment if the service member is still active? There's ways that, you know, with alimony, we can have what's called an income deduction order put in place so that the alimony is withheld directly from the service member's pay. So it's paid by DFAS to the former spouse. Um, so you don't have to worry about payments. The, the interesting piece with alimony, though, is if you have somebody that's paying alimony and then they retire and then they start collecting their pension. And the former spouse starts collecting their share of the pension. How does that affect alimony, right? Because now former spouse is receiving the pension. Theoretically, their need for alimony has gone down. So those are all things that we try to address on the front end to say, if we can reach an agreement on these things, to say, you know, maybe there's an automatic termination of alimony once the pension goes into effect, or maybe we need to offset the alimony on a dollar for dollar basis by each dollar that the former spouse is, ends up receiving from the pension. Because otherwise, everyone's just back in court all the time. <laughs> all the time. I imagine you just have to be on top of it in uh, sometimes uh, years after the divorce was settled. Yeah. That's crazy. All right. Uh, here's a new one that I have not heard of, the thrift savings plan, the TSP. What is the thrift savings plan and why are we talking about it with the divorce? So a thrift savings plan, you will see a thrift savings plan in in military cases. Um, It's called a military thrift savings plan. And then there's also a civilian thrift savings plan, which is something that people that are employed by the federal government can contribute to. So there are two different types of plans. But military members have the option of contributing to a thrift savings plan for their retirement. It's it's very much like a 401k type of plan, a typical retirement plan. But when you're contributing to a thrift savings plan, that's a marital asset. And so that's something else that we need to address as part of the divorce, potentially, if they are contributing to the thrift savings plan during the marriage, um, that's an asset that needs to be divided as well. I, that's another thing I would not have been able to keep track of. <laughs> so many details. The, the next question I think we're running into is calculating the service member's income. You would put that on your list of things that are important to think about. Isn't that just written down? <laughs> like, 
So aren't there aren't there scales for that? <laughs> So the service member's income is really interesting. And the great thing about dealing with service members is that their income is available to us online, right? So we can tell what a service member is making each year um, based on their years of service and their rank in service. So if we're having a hard time with a service member cooperating with providing their leave and earning statements, which is their pay stubs, as long as we know when they entered the military and what ranks they are, we can figure out what their pay is. So service members have usually three different types of pay, sometimes four, but it's generally their gross pay, which is just their regular pay. um, That's taxed just like regular income. And then they have a basic allowance for housing, which is tax-free housing allowance. And then they have a basic allowance for subsistence, which is basically an allowance for like clothing, living expenses, that type of thing. And that's also tax-free. And so when you're calculating things like child support, you have to be really careful and acknowledge what income is taxable for the service member and what isn't, because a lot of that income is tax-free. Um, so that frees up more money potentially that they have available for ability to pay alimony. And that also increases their net income when calculating child support. Um, sometimes you also have things like parachute pay. If they're deployed, you'll have hazard duty pay, which is also tax-free. Um, if they're living in another country, There'll be a cost of living for wherever they're li- whatever area of the world they're living in. There's a cost of living allowance or adjustment. So there's a lot of things to be aware of when determining what the service member's income actually is. Is there is there any accommodation for currency fluctuations? So they're all paid in U.S. dollars, even if they're you know stationed overseas. But yes, the cost of living um, adjustment that's on their paycheck, you know, they'll get additional income each month, depending on the value of the dollar, wherever it is that they're living. So that amount, you generally fluctuates on a monthly basis. Yeah. Uh, which I imagine also plays into the complexities of figuring out how to calculate this. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Who knew? <laughs> uh, okay. We started talking about kids earlier. Yes. Now we're digging into parenting plans. How do you handle building a parenting plan when parents are on the road so much? So when I have a military family come to me and they're dealing with a divorce, I always try to build into a parenting plan, a long distance schedule and a local schedule. And that's the great thing about when parties can work together and we can resolve things, we can be really creative in our parenting plans and we can do things that the court can't do. You know, you can't go to court with a military family and say, look, in three years, he's retiring and he's going to move back to Tampa. So, in you know, let's do a parenting plan that gives, you know, dad 50-50 timesharing when he comes back to Tampa because we know that's going to happen in three years. The court can't do that. They can't prospectively make changes to the parenting plan. You know, there's case law and things that say that there's no crystal ball and we can't look ahead to the future. But when we settle things and when we're in mediation and we're trying to resolve things for our family through settlement discussions and settlement communications, we can be really creative. And that's what I love about doing these military cases is really trying to work on a parenting plan that will work for this family long term. So they're they're not constantly having to go back to court to modify every time somebody moves. So we can put things in a parenting plan that says, yes, we agree that this service member is going to have to move every two to three years. And we're not going to make this service member have to go file a petition for relocation every single time that they move, right? So we can waive those like relocation requirements in the parenting plan. We can also, again, do that long distance schedule and that local schedule. So, you know, if the parents are living within 50 miles of each other, we'll follow one schedule and maybe that's a 50-50 schedule. But if the parents are living more than 50 miles, but as long as they're in the continental United States, we'll follow this schedule schedule. And then if it, if one of the parents is outside the continental United States, we'll follow a different schedule. You know, so we can be really creative in that regard. You make it sound so easy, but I imagine there are people who might be listening to this who are saying, I can't talk to my former spouse. So when you deal with a, a, a case that doesn't end in mediation and settlement, how do you end up trying to navigate around the, the crystal ball conundrum where you can't predict? Who I mean, is it just pretty much whoever's stationary gets the kid for a while? If you end up having to go to trial on a, a case where you have a military member 
And let's say the parties are both, you know, they're sta- the military members stationed at McDill. And so right now we can do a 50-50 schedule. But once the final judgment's entered, you know, maybe two years from now, we know that data is going to PCS. There's nothing that the court can do about it at that point in time. So we're going to have a 50-50 schedule. And then once dad gets his orders to PCS or have that permanent change of station, then he's going to have to go back to court and file a petition for relocation and say, I have these orders, I'm moving and ask the court to enter a new parenting plan. So when parties can get along and can resolve some of these issues up front so that they're not having to go back to court every single time there's a change, I think that is so beneficial for the family. You know, my, my head goes down the sort of the the conflict area. You know, I, I can imagine that a 50-50 split is great and then one parent leaves and the other parent is settled into 50-50 and now it frust- is frustrated that they their life, they're going to have to adapt in a way like that sort of conflict. Uh, I I, how, how do you, how do you help your clients navigate that level of conflict when the kids are at stake? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, the really hard thing is that when you're dealing with relocation, right? Like, let's say the service member files a petition for relocation and wants the kids to go with them to wherever they're going. I think that unfortunately, the service member is going to have an uphill battle to try to get the court to say, yes, go ahead and take the kids with you. Right. Because the kids have theoretically been in this in Tampa, let's just say, for the last four years. And so now the service member has to move. But now we're going to uproot the kids from the school that they've been in for the last three or four years. And we're going to go to this place for two, three, four years, potentially, depending on what the orders are. But it's not a permanent move. You know, they say it's a permanent station, but it's not. And so you know, the court is always going to be concerned about best interests of the child and stability for the child is going to be one of those things where if the child is in Tampa, acclimated, doing well in school, the other parent is a good parent, the service member is going to have a hard time saying that the kids should move with them. And that can be, you know, unfortunately, not fair to the service member. But when they retire, they always have the opportunity and the hope that they would come back to wherever the kids are. What is the general, what is the court's general perspective on these kinds of conflicts? But, you know, when we're talking to Seth, it, the, the refrain is the judge doesn't usually like being the, to step in uh, as a parent. The judge wants you to deal with this on your own. Uh, when dealing with this sort of military conflict, same vibe. The judge wants you to solve this and doesn't like stepping in. How do they generally handle these things? Well, I think that the judges are always, it doesn't matter if you're a military family or not, right? I think the judge always wants the parties to try to resolve between them because the parties are always going to know what's best for their kids, right? Not someone in a black robe that is hearing a few hours of testimony from each party and then has to make a decision about what's best for your children. I think you you as parents know what's best for your children more than a stranger, right? That's just evidence over a few hours, over a day or two. Um, so the courts are always going to want you to resolve it. And I think that the benefit of the parties resolving it is just the flexibility and, you know, the things that we can do that the court can't do in trying to resolve some of the issues between the parties. We've talked about uh, military pension and thrift savings plans. Let's talk about another benefit, GI Bill. Can GI Bill benefits be divided in a military divorce? No, they cannot be divided in a military divorce. The GI Bill is the basically the property of the the service member and they can do what they want with it. So I have a lot of times where the former spouse will say, you know, they want the service member to allocate a portion of the GI Bill to them so that they can go back to school or they want it ordered that the service member will um, award the GI Bill to the minor children um, or minor child. And if the service member will agree to that, great, we can put that in any sort of agreement. But it's not an asset that the court can divide or that the court can say that you have to name your kids as a beneficiary of the GI Bill or that you have to name your former spouse. But naming your former spouse as a beneficiary of the GI Bill is one of those things that I think can be super helpful when negotiating alimony, right? Because if they're able to go back to school and start earning more money, that's going to be better for the service member in the long term when you're talking about them paying alimony for an extended period of time. Totally, totally. And uh, you you made you were specific to minor children. GI Bill isn't transferable once the child is no longer a minor. The GI Bill can be um, awarded to 
child of of the service member. I was saying minor child just because generally when we're dealing with the divorce and the GI Bill, that's when the the children are minors, and so we're they want talking about it. Yeah, of credits allocated to you know if there's three ch- children, they'll want you know a certain number of credits allocated between each child or something like that. Okay. Okay. What do you find couples going into a divorce in the military generally miss? Common loopholes, gotchas, areas that they they didn't see coming, corners around which they could not peek. So one of the things that I think some people forget to realize is the jurisdictional issues associated with a military divorce. Because people will call and say, well, I have Florida residency. Um, I still have my Florida driver's license, but I'm stationed in Germany. Oh, and my kids are here in Germany with me. Well, great. Florida has jurisdiction to determine the financial issues. But if the kids have not resided in Florida for more than six months um, or for the six months prior to the filing of the petition, the Florida court has no jurisdiction over the children. And the German court would have to adjudicate any children's issues. So then you're dealing with a court in Germany dealing with some issues and you're dealing with the Florida court dealing with some issues. And the really interesting thing is sometimes the, let's just, I'm just using the German court as an example, but let's say the German court does adjudicate alimony and all of the financial issues and things like that. The German court cannot divide the military pension. So you're still going to have to come to Florida if that's where residency is to divide the pension. Wow. So I've had, you know, cases where everything was done in Germany, and then we just had to file something in Florida to divide the pension, which is super interesting. Wow. Okay. And jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I mean, you use Germany, but in your experience dealing with international courts, what is the sort of legal cultural divide? Like when you're thinking of, is there a better country to have to deal with this in uh, than others? You know, I honestly don't know. Um, the cases that I've had where, you know, the children's issues have been adjudicated in Germany or another foreign country, I honestly really didn't pay attention to what the parenting plan or the timesharing arrangement or anything like that ended up being because I was just focused on what we were dealing in the Florida court. But they really, you can't really, you can't forum shop the children's issues, right? So it's the, you only have jurisdiction where the children have resided for the last six months. So it's not that one jurisdiction is going to be better for you than the other as far as the children's issues, because that's not something that you can choose. You can't consent to subject matter jurisdiction over the children. So as far as the money stuff goes, you know, maybe some of these other countries have different laws pertaining to alimony and things like that, where it would be more beneficial to adjudicate alimony over there and just come to Florida for the pension. But it's definitely something that the service member should keep in mind. Well, it it seems like it. because I, I especially think when you're talking about the children and family issues, I know that there are cultural sort of norms, uh, country to country, that we may not anticipate. W- recognizing completely you can't <laughs> forum shop, as you as you put it. That's, that's awesome. Uh, you can't shop that around, but at least be aware that these are these are things that you might not consider. I, that's fascinating to me. Yeah, and sometimes I think people will, will wait to file for divorce because they don't want that foreign jurisdiction to adjudicate any of those issues, but they know that they're coming back to the United States in a few months or a year or something like that. So they'll wait to file anything until they're back in the United States. Cases, uh, obviously, being what they are, we, we're not making a general proclamation here. I'm not making asking you to make a proclamation, but is that something that you uh, advise uh, your clients to do in, in international cases? It's not something that I ever really take a position on because I don't know what the law is in that country. So I would never tell them, you know, wait until you come back to Florida to deal with the kids issues. I think it really depends on the relationship between the parties and how things are going, right? Like if it's amicable and everyone's fine, then if you're fine with waiting, then we can file after you've been back in Florida for six months and deal with the children's issues at that time. And then you can also deal with all of the other things. If you're fine with having things done in two separate courts, we can do that too. Does that, obviously, we, we recognize that the uh, time that it takes is obviously as long as it takes to, to deal with the divorce process and the separation, but also waiting six months after you return and also waiting to get back in the first place as we back into that schedule. But uh, in your experience, do the foreign courts work at about the same pace if you were to just say, I want to get divorced and we'll deal with it in two separate jurisdictions? You know, I've only seen a, a handful and it seemed like 
at least in the few that I've seen that, and they were just happened to be from Germany since we were using that example, it seemed like they took longer to adjudicate some of those issues. But your mileage may vary. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have a, uh, uh, this is the ceremonial transition to what we like to call the listener question okay. part of our show. <laughs> Seth is not here and you are the duly appointed representative of the listener question today. Are you ready? <laughs> I am ready. I think it's going to be, I think you're going to hit this one out of the park. Okay. What is this? The, the listener question is from Nona Nonanimous. Nona Nonanimous. No anonymous. Uh, producer Andy likes to have fun with me and sort of an anchorman vibe. And uh, that's what we're getting here. The question is thus. What is the difference between a social investigator and a gal? I'm assuming that's guardian ad, guardian ad litem. Yes. Very interesting question. Um, the a social investigation the investigator in Florida is um, appointed under Florida Statute 6120. And basically, a social investigator has to be a mental health professional, whereas a guardian ad litem does not have to be a mental health professional. A guardian ad litem can be an attorney. A guardian ad litem can be a mental health professional. A guardian ad litem could also be somebody that's just gone through training and is not an attorney or mental health professional. A social investigation generally also includes psychological evaluations of the parents, whereas a guardian ad litem, if they want a psychological evaluation of one or both parents, they have to ask the court for it. And then somebody else has to be appointed by the court in order to conduct that evaluation. So with the social investigation, we can be done as part of it, which if there are mental health issues, I think you want a social investigation done. And then the other big difference is that a social investigation is admitted into evidence without hearsay objections. And a guardian ad litem's report is not exempt from hearsay. So a lot of times you'll have, you'll hear attorneys argue when a guardian ad litem is being appointed, well, I'm not going to waive hearsay. Well, if you don't waive hearsay in a guardian ad litem's report, the report is generally worthless, in my opinion. Um, and I think most of the judges feel that way, where they're like, I'm not even going to appoint a guardian if you're not going to waive hearsay. So if you have a case where you want a parenting plan evaluation done, you want somebody telling the court what's in the best interest of this child, and the opposing side is saying, well, I'm not going to waive hearsay, I'm not going to waive hearsay, then your best bet is to ask for a social investigation because then you don't have to deal with those objections. Okay, I, I need you to to back up for the lay people, meaning me. Waiving hearsay specifically means what? So hearsay is any statement that is outside of court. So basically, if you and I are having a conversation and you tell me something, and I put that in my report, like I had a conversation with Pete on this day and he said X, Y, or Z about mom or dad or something that they did or something that he witnessed, right? That's an out-of-court statement that is potentially being used for the truth of the matter asserted. So it's considered hearsay and hearsay statements are not admissible in court. So most of what a guardian ad litem does and a social investigator does is they are interviewing collaterals, they're interviewing other people in the case. So they'll interview school counselors, teachers, therapists, coaches, babysitters, you know, anyone that's involved in the, with child is, you know, potentially going to be talked to by this person. Yeah. And all of them out of court. Right. And you're when you're doing your report, you're saying I spoke to so and so on such and such date. And so and so said this about mom or dad or the child. And so the whole report is just riddled with hearsay. And so it's really hard for a guardian to write a report that doesn't contain hearsay statements. And that's what opposing counsel is saying. We're going to waive hearsay, meaning it can include it can include hearsay okay, statements. And we're going to ad admit the report with those hearsay statements. And the guardian can testify about the hearsay statements. Okay. Important note, uh, because it seems like everything in the law is just a little bit backwards from where, where I would expect it to go. I'm glad to understand that. So that is the difference between a social investigator and a guardian ad litem. And it's a significant one, it sounds like. Yeah, it is a significant one. You know, I think that social investigations can be good in certain circumstances. I think some cases, you know, if you don't have all of the mental health issues and things like that, then you're more than fine with a guardian ad litem being appointed to the case. You just need to make sure that there's a hearsay waiver in the order of appointment. Hearsay waiver. You got it. Nona, no anonymous. Thank you so much for writing in this question. And thank you, Kristen, for the great answer. Hit it out of the park. I told you it was great. This has been great. Have we missed anything? Are there any major holes in our discussion that you feel like people absolutely need to know preparing for their military divorce 
before I let you back to work. You know, I think that the biggest thing with the um, military pension, another thing to keep in mind with that is the survivor benefit plan. That is something that secures the pension for the former spouse in the event of the service member's death. So if the service member were to pass away and you're relying on that pension, well, once they die, you don't receive that pension any any, any longer unless you were the beneficiary of the survivor benefit plan and that was elected at the time of retirement. So that's a big thing to make sure that you address in your marital settlement agreement or if you're going to trial, ask the court to award um, you as being named the former spouse beneficiary of the survivor benefit plan because that is a huge benefit um, that a lot of people forget about. And if it's not mentioned and if it's not elected at the time that the service member retires, you can't get it. But then the other thing you have to keep in mind and a big problem that people have and forget is if you do get named the former spouse beneficiary, there has to be a deemed election submitted to DFAS within one year of the final judgment being entered. And so if you forget to do that within the one year and that deemed election isn't accepted and honored, you lose that right to be the former spouse beneficiary. I can't tell you how many people have come to me saying that, you know, my final judgment was entered five years ago and my spouse didn't do this. And there's really not a whole lot we can do to fix it. Wow. I, this is so you in my head, you opened a can of worms with this. Yeah. How does it work? Uh, how do these uh, uh, associations work when the service member not died, but remarried it, when it comes to survivor benefits and things like that? So if the service member remarries, that's going to be like one of those things where if the deemed election wasn't submitted, naming the former spouse as a beneficiary, then the, the service member spouse is likely going to try to list their current spouse as a beneficiary. And that's where the problem comes in, right? But if you already have a former spouse beneficiary as the um, beneficiary listed for the survivor benefit plan, then the service member cannot list the new spouse as the beneficiary. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is sometimes when we're dealing with these service members, you have to remember that when they you know, enter the service, a lot of times they're 18 years old. So after 20 years of service, they're only 38, 39 by the time they retire. And so if you are representing the former spouse and she wants to be named the survivor, survivor benefit plan beneficiary, and she's only 38 years old or in her early 30s, you have to talk to her. Do you think you'll ever get remarried? Because if you get remarried before the age of, oh my gosh, now I'm going to blank. I think it's 57. You're going to lose that survivor benefit plan beneficiary designation if you get remarried. So then we might want to talk about maybe having life insurance instead of survivor benefit plan to secure the pension because that's a huge thing that you're going Losing and that you may have paid for because survivor benefit plan is paid for by both parties based on their pro rata share of the pension. You know, you don't want to. That's for fascinating. It. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad we opened that can of worms <laughs> up again. Wow. That is really fascinating. Okay. So that's a big one. That's a big one. Don't get caught with the survivor uh, benefit challenges. Yes. Uh, amazing. Kristen, thank you so much. Yeah, so th- this was uh, illuminating. I'm so glad you came by to to uh, to share this with our folks. Pete, can I tell you one more thing? Gosh, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm with open arms. So the other thing that people need to make sure when there is a pension that's being divided and there is more than ten years of service, there it has to be language in the final judgment that allows DFAS to divide that pension. And if your final judgment is missing that magic language, DFAS will not accept it. So you have to make sure that you have somebody that knows what they're doing involved in the entry of your final judgment and entry of a military pension division order to make sure that it's accepted by DFAS and complies with the NDAA requirements for the court order. Okay, so I hope everybody was taking notes. Yes. They can, these, these tidbits come hard and fast. <laughs> Write them down. Check the transcript, everybody. Thank you so much, Kristen Scully, for coming by here again. Welcome to the firm. So, so glad to have you. Thank you. Was- Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and attention. Don't forget, if you have a question for the show, just visit howtosplitatoaster.com, and there's a button right there that says submit a question. You submit a question, and it will get answered, maybe by Seth, maybe by our special guests. That's the really exciting part. On behalf of Kristen Scully, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships.
How to Split a Toaster is part of the True Story FM podcast network, produced by Andy Nelson, music by T-Bless and the Professionals, and DB Studios. Seth Nelson is an attorney with NLG Divorce and Family Law with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of NLG Divorce and Family Law. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.